In the 18th century, Europe was ramping up wide-scale colonization of the world, and the Enlightenment and other political changes were sweeping Europe itself. But Russia felt out of the loop, like they were being left behind, culturally and militarily. It was during this time of radical change that Peter the Great started Russia's westernization. European diplomats, military and cultural influence, and languages flooded in, with a lot coming from pre-revolutionary France. Many in Russia's upper classes loved everything French, to the point that they started to abandon the Russian language to learn French. A resident of the British Embassy wrote in 1768, If their children can read, speak, and write French, the Russians desire no more. French overtook Russian as the primary language of the elite, but it wasn't able to conquer Russia unopposed. There were some who advocated for Russians to pick up their native language again, especially the increased usage of Church Slavonic, which was the archaic form of Russian spoken in the church. Let's talk about how this backlash against French helped create early Russian nationalism. So yeah, one quick aside before we get into this. All of what I'm going to talk about only regards the elite of Russia, because most Russians were still illiterate serfs. So it wasn't like everyone on the farm started talking about baguettes instead of borscht to each other or anything like that. There were three main reasons Russians started speaking French to each other. Let's go through them now. One of Peter the Great's mandates required the nobility to get jobs in the administration or military. This forced nobles to educate themselves and become literate to do their new jobs. The later emperor, Peter III, freed nobles from this obligation in 1762. But now, all of these nobles were super literate and unemployed, so they started to create a literary culture like their counterparts in Europe. There were also practical reasons for the adoption of French. Most European royal courts didn't understand Russian, and some didn't even know it existed, like members of the French Academy. French was a bridge language, or a lingua franca, if you like to use random phrases from other languages to confuse your readers. It was a lot like English is today. French was being used across Europe, which provided further justification for its use and a self-affirming cycle. If an Austrian and a Swede and an Italian wanted to have a conversation, they could just speak in French. So Russians needed to use French to communicate to the rest of Europe that it was becoming a modern nation and gain access to, for example, military technology from other Europeans. After all, it wouldn't have been possible for Russians to tell the French Academy of their language's existence if they didn't use French to do it. Powerful European countries thought Russia was not a member of civilized Europe like them. The logic was that Russia lacked figures like Voltaire and other great works of philosophy, science, literature, and stuff like that. Of all the courts in Europe, the French nobility were the most respected. As Derek Offord says in his book, the French language in Russia, a social, political, cultural, and literary history, the French had a way of life unrivaled on the continent at that time in its refinement, gaiety, good taste, and comfort. This made the use of French in noble circles a signal of status. For Russian nobles aspiring to be anywhere near as respected as the French, speaking with them in their language became the first step to achieve that goal. Now that French was a status symbol, those who didn't speak it started to face peer pressure. One example of this is from Russian writer Fonvizin, who wrote in his memoirs about a time when he was met by an entitled Zoomer whose very manner impressed me by his evident sense of self-worth. He asked me if I could speak French. When I responded that I couldn't, his interest in me seemed to pass rather quickly. Apparently, he considered me ignorant and improperly schooled. After this, Fonvizin immediately began learning French. Obviously, nobles wouldn't want to be bad parents by letting their kids get bullied for speaking in a primitive language. So, schools started to instruct in French instead of Russian. Out of the 245 students in the cadet corps in 1733, only 18 studied Russian. French became the medium to learn other subjects such as geometry or science, and students were encouraged to write letters to their tutors and the school administrators in French. Today we know that there aren't inherent differences between languages that make some superior to others, but 18th century elites thought differently. A French noble, Louis-Antoine Caricoli, 
once said when talking about how French was being spoken in royal courts across the continent, the world has been seduced by the way people talk in France. It is amenity itself speaking, candor itself that laughs. What is agreeable mingles with what is useful, what is news with what is unspeakable. And conversation moves from one subject to the next as imperceptibly as the most delicate nuances, among the tenderest colors happily blended. An Englishman never used to have any subject but that which concerned his government. An Italian talked only about music, a Dutchman only about his commercial interests, a Swiss gentleman only about his country, a Pole about his freedom, an Austrian about his lineage. Now there is a unison of voices for the ways of conversation. We speak of everything, and we speak well. This quote helps us understand the qualities of character not only assigned to the languages, but to the people who spoke them. So an attack on a language was also an attack on the speaker. This will be important later. While people talked about certain languages being better than others, and French was most often used internationally, it seemed most Europeans, like the English for example, still spoke their native language when talking to each other. So even in this era of increasing globalization, languages were still associated with national identity. So to speak Italian was to be Italian. If this line of thinking is applied to Russia, what would happen to the Russian identity if their language faded from use? The idea that the Russian identity might disappear entirely if the rich wanted to be discount French nobles instead of being proud of their culture created a lot of scared nationalists who took this development as a humiliation. The Russian writer Nikolai Karamzin referenced this when visiting England in his book Letters of a Russian Traveler. Why, in our so-called best society, you are deaf and dumb without French. Is it not disgraceful not to have national self-respect? Why be parrots and apes? They started to wonder how the status of French as a prestige language would hurt Russian national pride. When we think about this, it's pretty clear why Russian nationalists were so angry at them abandoning and ridiculing their own language. They must have seen this as tantamount to abandoning your nation. When Russians found out that even the educated French academy didn't know Russian existed, they felt that not only their language, but their entire way of life was being attacked. Russian nationalists also used antiquization to give their language value. Now, I made a whole video about this a while ago, so if this seems interesting, I'll link that video at the end of this one. Basically though, antiquization is when a country makes up or embellishes an epic origin story for themselves to give their people something to be nationalistic about, often paired to the idea that they have fallen from grace. If you're already sensing that this is pretty fashy, you're right. A great example of this is when fascist Italy positioned themselves as the spiritual successors to ancient Rome to co-opt some of its reputation and make up for their inferiority complex with other colonial powers. In Russia, authors Trejakovsky and Sumarakov argued that the Russian language was a descendant of Slovenian, the ancestor of all European languages. They said that their root words are shorter than other languages. One example is the Russian word for I being oko the Latin oculus, and the German auge. This proved to them that German and Latin were the descendants of Russian. This was all done to retroactively tie Russian into the European family of languages and encourage Russian nobles to feel superior for speaking the noble ancestor of a European language. Many Russians felt that the French language was invading their country, so speaking more Russian wasn't enough. They needed to expel every French word from the dictionary to keep their language pure. Perfectly good French words with no Russian equivalents were removed, and Russian words were just made up to fill their place. This would be like if we Americans stopped saying sauerkraut and replaced it with something stupid like freedom cabbage. Oh. This is why Church Slavonic was so appealing. It was virtually unchanged, so it contained none of the French contamination which everyday Russian was infected with, and stirred up ideas of a forgotten past in which Russia was truly great. Another problem in the eyes of these nationalists were the numerous dialects of Russian, which they saw as harmful to national unity because everyone spoke a different version of their language, which is only a problem because they made it so important to national identity in the first place. Obviously, I'm not trying to say that the only factor of nationalism at the time was linguistic, 
But it's also not a coincidence that so much energy was spent creating dictionaries and standardizing the language and encouraging nobles to create a literary tradition. French came to Russia so rapidly that it completely scared some Russian nobles and led to a rise in Russian nationalism before that trend would really hit Europe later in the 19th and 20th centuries, which makes this a really interesting anomaly. Anyway, thank you for watching. Here are the links to my Antiquization video and my Russia video. If you enjoyed this one, I'm pretty sure you'd enjoy either of those because I kind of came up with the ideas for all three of these videos in like one big research session, so they're all really interrelated, um, especially like the Antiquization part, obviously. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Um, I really enjoyed making this and I hope you enjoyed watching it.